Well, let's go ahead and get started. Our first presentation is titled KT Strategies to Increase Use of the Canadian Occupational Performance Measure in Stroke Rehabilitation. Dr. Piper Hansen is an academic field work coordinator and clinical assistant professor at the University of Illinois at Chicago. She most recently held the role of clinical practice leader and occupational therapist at Shirley Ryan Ability Lab. Dr. Hansen's participation in research has included projects in knowledge translation, assessment, and interventions in neurorehabilitation. If you have any questions during the presentation, please ask them in the chat box and we'll address them as we can. Using the chat questions, I'll also be moderating a Q&A following Piper's presentation. Piper, are you ready to begin? I am, thank you. Thank you. All right, so hello everyone. It's a pleasure to join you today and share some of my recent knowledge translation work in the area of assessment use and rehabilitation. So first, just a little bit more about me. I've been an occupational therapist for the past 15 years, so my general background has been fairly clinically focused. Much of this time has been spent providing therapy services in inpatient neurorehabilitation, like was previously mentioned. I held the role of clinical practice leader at Shirley Ryan Ability Lab for about the past six years. And there, I was overseeing knowledge translation projects to promote the increased use of evidence-based practice um, and also to create uh, new clinical practice guidelines and standards for within the organization. Myself and the organization have held a particular focus on the integration of standardized assessments as a standard of practice throughout the full continuum of care within rehabilitation. What I'll be sharing with you this afternoon is just one piece of a multi-year and kind of multi-layered project uh, that was more globally related to assessment use in inpatient rehabilitation. Just for a little bit of more context about the environment in which this project took place, uh, the inpatient level of care of the organization is housed within a freestanding rehabilitation hospital and the hospital itself has 242 beds. Specifically for this project, we target two of the seven total adult rehabilitation floors, and these two floors particularly specialize in stroke rehabilitation. So just to give you a little bit of idea how we'll spend our time together today, I'll start with providing some background related to occupational therapy, the occupational therapy evaluation process as it relates specifically to this project, the use of rehabilitation assessments and an assessment battery, uh, particularly in relation to the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab practice guidelines uh, that were established about five years ago. And then I'll also provide a brief overview of the Canadian Occupational Performance Measure, uh, which I'll also refer to as the COPM, which again is the primary focus of this presentation. I'll then highlight some high level details of the project itself as well as kind of next steps within this study's exploration. I'll end with some lessons learned and clinically relevant takeaways and implications specific to clinical practice for the group to further discuss at the end of the presentation. At the core of occupational therapy is the concept of occupational performance. So an occupation is any activity that you might engage in. It could be something more common and basic that we do every day, like brushing our teeth in the morning, to the collective tasks that make up all of our work days. The definition of occupational performance more specifically is a person's ability to perform these activities, tasks, or roles for a living. Again, it's essentially, it's the day-to-day -day things that we all do. Each person's occupational performance is a triad of the characteristics inherent to the person or the client themselves what demands a specific activity or occupation has that they're engaging in, as well as the where, the how, and the why, otherwise known as the kind of context and environment of that particular activity. So you can kind of see this triad here on this slide. So two people may be engaging in the same occupation, but their experiences and their occupational performance can vastly vary. Um, this could be because of individual individual factors between the two people themselves, like different heights or uh, their motivation to complete the activity. But more importantly, and um, also to not be forgotten, is that the environment that the activity is taken into. 
Um, this could be, if you're, an example of this could be if you're trying to cook breakfast in the morning. Do you have all of the necessary materials and space that's needed? Or are you in more of a cluttered kitchen? That's gonna dramatically impact your occupational performance. In order to adequately address occupational performance, it's imperative to obtain all of the associated information about someone, and then also the context in which they're engaging, as I just mentioned. And many of these categories are listed here and are included in someone's occupational profile, as it's referred to within occupational therapy. As an occupational therapist or an OT myself, it's my responsibility to essentially conduct a fact-finding mission as part of the initial therapy evaluation uh, to develop this occupational profile um, or more generally a holistic view of the person. Through this profile, I as the occupational therapist obtain individualized information about the client who is seeking my services and from there can begin to determine where I may best provide intervention. That intervention might be uh, improving strength, completing an environmental assessment, uh, training the individual on compensatory training, and so on. While the occupational profile is a vital component of the occupational therapy evaluation process, and it really provides much of the necessary information to direct a therapy treatment plan, it doesn't directly contribute to rehabilitation outcomes which are becoming increasingly more important in today's healthcare and climate within the United States. Despite the necessity of obtaining a comprehensive occupational profile, this process is also wrought with many barriers. Uh, for example, it can take a significant amount of time to complete. And in an environment where time is at a premium, this information can also get commonly lost within the electronic medical record and not necessarily utilized to its full potential. Also, this type of more narrative personal information is not necessarily valued by third party payers. And this can sometimes uh, be just too much information and doesn't necessarily provide a narrow focus to create prioritized goals and to best direct therapy services. So globally in rehabilitation at the post acute care level, the use of assessments again is becoming increasingly more common part of the therapy process. Clinicians administer assessments to measure muscle strength, walking speed, someone's memory, and so on. For example, in the photo on the slide, the person is attempting a test item of the action research arm test that assesses someone's ability to grasp, grip, pinch, and their general arm mobility in a contrived clinical environment. While these types of assessments are provide really helpful information and objective data. They do not speak directly to the person's personal concerns related to their occupational performance. Because occupational performance is a central theme to occupational therapy, and uh, while also engaging a client in the goal setting process and setting their own therapy priorities, uh, there really can be a dramatic disconnect between uh, someone's therapy, per personal therapy goals and the common assessments that are being used in rehabilitation. For me, I believe that if you're gonna be addressing occupational performance as a central theme to the therapy treatment plan, that this should also be measured and documented whenever possible. A clinical assessment battery in rehabilitation benefits from the use of a standardized assessment, such as the Canadian Occupational Performance Measure, to promote comprehensive assessment, not just from the client level our client factor level, but also to include activity and participatory levels as well. So the COPM is an available standardized assessment that was first published in 1991, and it's been used in a wide variety of settings. The COPM expands upon a traditional occupational profile using a more semi-structured interview style. But in addition to gaining information about meaningful occupations for each individual, it also includes a scoring process so that the COPM can be used as an outcome measure to track change during rehabilitation. Again, it's important to know what one's occupational profile is while, but while still ensuring that there is objective data to demonstrate the unique value of the rehabilitation interventions or those specific to occupational therapy, while still striving to improve the salience and the meaningfulness of that therapy that's provided.
So as an example, this month, Chicago hosted their annual marathon. And as an occupational therapist, if one of the individuals in the photo was coming to me for therapy, it'd be important for me to know if they were the marathon runner or the person enjoying their breakfast while watching the marathon runners. And again, environment and context can be similar. Uh, both individuals took over the streets of Chicago. They were crossing a busy bridge, um, but the occupation was different. The last part of the triad that we previously discussed was the client factors. So if one of the individuals was one of those marathon runners, it would also be important for me to know if they were the professional marathon runner that recently broke the uh, recent time record, if they were more of a weekend warrior, or if they're someone who tried out the marathon but was just really wishing that they had trained more. So through the use of the COPM, the OT can not only gain information about what the person needs and wants to do, but further explores an individual's satisfaction and their own perceived performance within their occupational profile and will quantify that information for outcome tracking. So for those of you that are unfamiliar with this particular assessment, I wanted to take a few moments to briefly review the process with you just to provide a little bit more context about what some of the challenges associated with its clinical use truly are. The next two slides are gonna depict the general process of COPM administration. The consumer first identifies meaningful activities within three primary categories, which are self-care, productivity, and leisure for themselves, and then rates the level of importance of those activities uh, for themselves on a scale of one to 10. Uh, so the process would go that, again, during this kind of brainstorming session, the occupational therapy would um, ask probing questions about any activities that the person mentions. Um, so if someone is in the hospital and they uh, mention their role as a father is something that was important to them, um, myself as the OT would then ask additional questions about their role as a father. What kind of activities do they engage in that's meaningful to them uh, when they're interacting with their children? Um, if they mentioned that it, they were, one of the things that they always do is cook their kids breakfast in the morning, I would ask questions about, um, is it a hot breakfast, a cold breakfast, try to gain some details about that information. Again, until I have a tangible kind of therapy goal that we can work on. So after this initial brainstorming session to discuss activities, up to five of the most important occupations uh, from all of those potential categories are then further scored on a one to 10 scale. But now in the areas of someone's performance, so if they were to complete that activity today, uh, how would they kind of anticipate that they would be able to perform and complete that activity? And then they rate their satisfaction about what, their what today's performance would potentially be also on a scale of one to 10. These scores are then further kind of subdivided into an average category, average score that can be used um, for reporting. So these identified occupations can then assist with goal setting and in the integration of meaningful occupations and activities into the treatment plan. So just in kind of briefly describing this process, you can probably start to see some of the inherent challenges of integrating the Canadian Occupational Performance Measure with consumers after stroke. These individuals may have uh, cognitive challenges, they may be experiencing deficits within their communication styles, um, and they also might not have tried these activities yet. So they're not really able to as accurately report uh, what their performance might potentially be. Another limitation is also external to the person, but um, can also influence the COPM's impact on rehabilitation in that not all these activities can be completed within a hospital or institutional setting. So this kind of leads me to the project that I wanted to discuss with you today. And so globally, this project aimed to address these challenges through the use of knowledge translation frameworks to address an obvious practice gap with, uh, with that increased emphasis on creating local knowledge and to create clinical practice change that, that were, could, excuse me, that could change, a, uh, that, the change that could occur using established knowledge translation tools and strategies. Inpatient stroke rehabilitation was selected as the targeted group because it was the lowest performing group in terms of the COPM administrations throughout the whole organization. And it was significantly lower than any of the other teams. And I'll mention that 
uh, and discuss it a little bit more in detail in a few minute moments. So the primary question of the project uh, was how do occupational, ther occupational therapists practice patterns impact the knowledge to action process when introducing the Canadian Occupational Performance Measure in an inpatient stroke rehabilitation setting. We also wanted to look at things like uh, systematically reviewing the experience and perceived barriers of using the COPM with the specific population a bit further. As my role as an educator within the organization and a provider of continuing education, I wanted to learn more about the educational experiences and how that influences practice and how this education needs to be structured to maximize successful utilization of new knowledge and practice. I wanted to explore if there were any inherent characteristics of the individual occupational therapists that were participating in this project uh, that may potentially influence the use of the COPN. And in this instance, we utilized uh, practice patterns that were associated with global evidence-based practice use. So this slide just provides kind of a high level overview of the project itself. Um, again, like I mentioned, we recruited therapists from two different rehab units that specialize in treating individuals after stroke rehabilitation. Um, and these OTs engaged in uh, two facilitated in-services with some time before and after to also apply some of the concepts that the discussion and these facilitated in-services reviewed. One of our primary outcome measures was a pre and post survey that you can see we completed prior to any engagement within the in-services. And the post survey was administered about a week after the completion of the final pilot. So I think that we all know that the, the traditional strategy in clinical education uh, does not necessarily work. And I've also heard this strategy kind of referred to as the train and pray model of education. So for the purposes of this presentation, I want to focus less on the evaluation framework and the evaluation process that was utilized. Um, so that's not necessarily depicted on this slide here, um, but I want to kind of focus on some of those intervention strategies uh, that were used as well as the kind of the global process. So you can see a few of these samples listed here on this slide, and I'll also highlight a few as well. A large component of this project was focused primarily on training and education. And we'll talk a little bit more about what this training looked like later on, but we really wanted this to be a kind of a dynamic, ongoing training um, and supports that were being provided to the occupational therapist. It was also very targeted in its focus. Um, in addition to that, uh, those um, facilitated in-services that the therapists participated in, we also created some additional educational materials that we thought that might be helpful. Um, and this was done in conjunction with the therapists themselves. One example of this was creating supportive communication cards uh, to utilize with clients who had aphasia so that it provided a, a consistency in terms of communication and the administration process across the teams. Uh, I also want to highlight that we really focus on kind of developing interrelationships of the participants and the stakeholders. So we really identified kind of uh, champions of the assessments within each teams, kind of who are the bright stars, and we helped them to uh, present different cases to their peers, um, share their experiences and successes, um, and we really wanted to focus on the most kind of difficult scenarios, the most uh, challenging um, experiences that the clinicians were having to really kind of push the clinicians to kind of thinking outside of kind of where they currently were in terms of their assessment use. A lot of the in-services also uh, surrounded around kind of tailoring uh, the assessment itself to our new context. In this case, it was the stroke population. So again, we used a lot of facilitated discussions, a lot of examples and cases uh, to help kind of guide and tailor the education and provide a little bit of structure to our discussions. Um, as well as coming up with different ways to kind of modify the administration process ways that we could make it easier, make it a bit more streamlined uh, to meet the barriers that people were experiencing. Some other strategies that were integrated that were not necessarily included here on this slide were modifications to the electronic medical record, as well as uh, other logistics that were addressed, um, such as 
making sure that people had the assessment forms and that everyone knew where the assessment forms were. Uh, we had discussions around how to schedule the assessment, the timing of the assessment, um, and how to kind of plan ahead to make sure that you're being more successful. So in order to better understand why the COPM isn't being used, one must first understand existing barriers within the COPM in practice. Some of those were related to some of the logistics that I just mentioned. Another is an occupational therapist's individual traits and practice patterns related to their beliefs and use of evidence-based practice. So the four kind of practice patterns that we referred to within this project are listed here on this slide. I'll just briefly review them. So the first is a traditionalist, and this would be someone who really relies on their own clinical reasoning and the opinion of other experts. So they really value clinical experience over evidence or new literature research. A pragmatist really focuses on the client's individual needs in any particular moment and not necessarily on that of evidence-based practice guidelines. They highly value experience over the evidence um, but they will potentially choose assessments or interventions that are evidence-based based and solely driven on their practicality. Someone who is in the receptive category utilizes evidence-based practice, but tends to also follow the opinions of experts, and they tend to lead, sorry, they tend to lean towards valuing the evidence over experience but they also don't want to be the one who's looking different in the clinic. They don't want to necessarily uh, be the one that's standing out around their peers. And the fourth practice pattern that we utilized specifically for this project was a seeker. Um, and a seeker utilizes evidence-based practice rather than relying on their own experience. So they're always looking to create change and see what's next and what's new. And this can also be um, a little bit to their detriment at times, in that they're kind of regardless of, of how practical the evidence might potentially be in a real clinical setting, and regardless of what kind of what other people are doing, they're finding ways to create change in their practice. So it's great to have seekers on your team. We hypothesize that seekers would most likely integrate the Canadian Occupational Performance Measure into their clinical practice, and that the seekers documentation would reflect more diverse goal categories and would also integrate what we defined as more participation-based goals into their goal setting, not necessarily just fall into the categories of self-care activities or exercises, um, but that their goals would also better reflect um, each individual's characteristics. So we had a small but a dedicated group, um, but it was general, in general a pretty fair representation of the total occupational therapist inpatient uh, stroke rehabilitation teams at the time. Um, there was otherwise 10 total therapists to participate. Uh, one of them was myself. Um, one person was on maternity leave. And the third person that did not participate had increased administration responsibility, so declined to participate specifically in this project. But you can kind of see there's a vast um, number of years of experience, but generally they were newer clinicians. And then here's a breakdown of the therapist's self-reported practice patterns or style. Um, we kind of also compared this to a 2007 study that um, explored about 100 occupational therapist practice styles. Um, and in that study, they were classified, 65% of that group was classified as a pragmatist. And only 2% of the uh, group within this study were represented as seekers. So you can see there's a little bit of a difference within this group. It could just be potentially because of the small number, um, but also because this study took place in an academic research hospital. Uh, we also think that this might account for differences uh, within this group in terms of there's a, a few more seekers than you might otherwise think, and there also was no traditionalist in the group. So a little bit about the methods that we used. Like I mentioned before, we utilized a pre and post test survey uh, to assess the occupational therapist knowledge of the COPM, and we'll show you some of those questions in a moment. Um, but for a review of the participation-based goal setting and client-centered care, we also completed a pre and post chart review. 
Uh, the patient records uh, that were selected had been individuals that were admitted in either a three-month time period uh, before we had started this intervention um, and a three-month post the intervention. Um, and the, their primary diagnosis was stroke. Uh, the other component of the charts that we pulled was that the identified primary therapist was one of the participating ther occupational therapists in the study as well. So from a randomized list of charts, uh, we again, we randomly selected 10 charts for each of the participating OTs. Uh, this was five charts uh, from the pre-intervention time frame and five from the post, just to kind of get a basic sense of what uh, the occupational therapists were documenting. Uh, then we further analyzed the findings of the chart review to determine if there were any initial trends in practice in their own practice related to their practice patterns. I just want to take a brief step back to review the intervention sessions themselves. So the COPM was a really well-known assessment to the group. Uh, like I mentioned before, it was established in 1991, so it's commonplace in education that all the occupational therapists went to, as well as other continuing education that they had been exposed to. So instead of kind of repeating the basic information about the assessment they had probably previously heard, we really focused more on building upon their previous knowledge to increase application of this knowledge through practice-based learning. Uh, this method was specifically used to facilitate critical thinking skills and self-directed learning, as well as facilitation of social learning. And we really wanted to target and really challenge with our currently held beliefs around this assessment itself and how that assessment could impact their practice. So we utilized cases of current consumers that were uh, currently receiving inpatient rehabilitation so that most of the participating OTs kind of knew who they were. And these cases were used to demonstrate the impact of the COPM in clinical practice. And it really led to fairly impactful discussions. We really wanted to broaden the occupational therapist's perspective of who they would consider, uh, who, who, who they would consider is actually kind of COPM appropriate and who would be a challenging patient to administer this assessment with. Uh, we really wanted to change the definition that the uh, therapists really kind of had in their minds around this specific assessment. So for example, one of the occupational therapists that were par was participating in the pilot um, reported back in the second uh, facilitated in-service that they had the, thought about utilizing the COPM with one of their newly admitted uh, consumers. Uh, she was a young mother who had had a stroke during childbirth but had decided against it because she thought that the person was too emotional, that was going to be too challenging of a conversation to have. Um, so we utilized the time within our facilitated in-service uh, as a group to really provide her some guidance and some coaching uh, collectively, again, as a group, not necessarily just from the facilitator. And she actually did go back and administer the assessment with good results and, and kind of reported back that she was um, happy that, that we had essentially kind of talked her into it to begin with, um, but that it really uh, was a promising experience and, and kind of changed what she was doing going, uh, moving forward. So the primary survey results are here and expressed to reflect the group collectively. And because it was such a small N, only the initial effect size was, was determined and kind of general trends were noted. So there is limited pre to post score change for a few of the questions. And these were those questions that were a bit more conceptually focused, um, but they were also rated fairly high on our scale of one to five initially. Um, a couple of these questions were related to uh, their confidence in the concept of participation, knowing the purpose of measuring participation with this assessment, and how measuring participation enhances the focus of occupation in the treatment plan. Thankfully, though, those questions uh, that demonstrated the greatest change were those that were the most clinically relevant, and I think that's probably to be expected. Um, a couple of examples of this were that the participants felt adequately trained to administer the COPM. Even though we didn't necessarily uh, talk about basic administration, we talked about how to address those different barriers instead. Um, they felt that they knew how to interpret the COPM results specifically related to goal setting which again was a big focus of this project. And also how to use COPM statistics to improve goal setting and also be more objective in their use of the assessment itself. They weren't, they're kind of moving beyond just utilizing the occupations. 
with the additional information and interpretation. And so now I'll share a little bit more about that chart review. So we started with a total of 725 client records. 450 of these pulled were from the pre time frame, and 272 were from the post intervention phase. These charts were randomly selected from a, an established database until uh, and then were randomly selected and, and pulled until five charts from each of the two time points, the pre and the post time frames per participating OT were reviewed. So in addition to looking at the goals, we also noted if the COPM was administered um, and with these different groups of patients um, and also review again, then reviewed the goals that were written by each occupational therapist. Each goal was then categorized in one of the 11 categories that are listed on this slide. So the most common category across the board was uh, considered an ADL or an activity of daily living. Uh, and these are those self-care activities like brushing your teeth, eating, dressing, that sort of thing. And it's pretty common that these goals are uh, going to probably rank the highest within inpatient rehabilitation as that the use of the functional independence measure and now the quality indicators and GG code items are required by Medicare. Um, the other category that we really highly focused in on was the leisure and community focus goal category, uh, because this is what we felt best represented what we we're looking for in terms of participatory goal level goals that were being set. In total, 632 goals were written by the seven OTs in the charts that we looked at. Again, the additional layer of this analysis was that the, the analysis was exploring was if there were any trends related to reported self practice style or practice pattern and their actual application of the educational objectives and goals. So again, our hypothesis was that seekers would be more likely to modify their practice than any of the other groups. And we did see that specific trend. So the seekers had more diverse goals. Uh, more diverse goal categories across the different in charts that we reviewed um, and also seekers uh, much more significantly incorporated those participatory goals into their treatment plan. So beyond just again those kind of basic self cares exercise balance. There was a lot more kind of occupation focus and participatory focus goals included in the goals. From the charts that we reviewed, three of the charts had utilized the Canadian Occupational Performance Measure a minimum of two times during the person's stay, so at least at admission and discharge. And it was one from each different category. So one seeker, one pragmatist, and one person that was in the receptive category had administered the COPM from the charts that we reviewed. Um, even though this was a, a smaller number, um, it was definitely improvement from our pre-survey in which all of the participating OT said that they had not re administered the, this assessment for at least six months or more. Um, and honestly, the majority of this team also said they had never administered the COPM um, on one of their clients after stroke and inpatient rehabilitation. And so to kind of give you a general sense of the current COPM administration numbers within the, the organization, um, totally in inpatient rehabilitation, about 50% of the individuals have the COPM administrated, administered at least two times uh, during someone's length of stay. Um, and the stroke population is, is half that. It's 25%. It has, has been utilizing the COPM consistently to demonstrate change during rehabilitation. So there's definitely an improvement from never using it, um, but there's definitely some room for continued attention um, and improvements. So I just wanted to end with kind of a few implications for clinical practice. I don't think that any of this is necessarily new news or new, informa new information by any means. But I just wanted to highlight a few things um, that I have found to be the most important uh, related to uh, translation and kind of a complex, hectic hospital environment. So the first thing I wanted to highlight was kind of focused training. So like I mentioned before, the OTs had participated in kind of traditional education multiple times about this specific assessment, and it hadn't really influenced their use of it to date. So instead of providing education that would be kind of the kitchen sink and sharing a lot of information, 
uh, we really took a step back to make sure that we were taking into account adult learning styles um, so that they could kind of take this information and apply it, analyze it in new and complex ways. Uh, we also thought that it would be, it's really helpful to make sure that it's a topic that the therapist can really engage in. So we weren't asking for a lot of their time. These in-services were kind of quick lunch in time in-services that we bribed them with food to come to. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, clinicians who are kind of are busy throughout their day have a lot of different um, barriers to, to these, participating in these kind of studies. Um, really want to know that they can have something tangible that they can take back to their clients the next day. And so we really kind of focused again um, on making sure that we were even discussing people that they were currently to be seen so they could apply the concepts and try um, things that we had discussed um, right in that, that same day, if not the next day. And again, I think that this idea of kind of collective learning and support can be really effective, even more so than just an expert's opinion. Um, and I think that by facilitating discussions, um, having people um, share stories and really create kind of an open dialogue helps to propel the conversation forward um, even more so than again, any traditional education potentially might. The other thing I wanted to highlight was having organizational support as key. So this was kind of a small, um, kind of more, more grassroots project, but I think that it's always important to make sure that clinical management, uh, the directors, and just organizational support in general is, um, is on board. And, and I find can be even more difficult than interacting with the clinician sometimes. Um, finding management buy-in has been uh, much easier when it's very explicit about what the potential impact to organizational standards like patient satisfaction can be. So for example, um, when we were discussing this project with uh, the stroke rehabilitation management team, um, a few questions on their kind of post rehabilitation survey, uh, the Prescani survey, um, had questions related to how the consumers uh, felt that they were engaged in their own goal setting, um, which has always been historically rated very low within the organization. So we were able to really target the specific uh, priorities, priority of um, the management team uh, through the increasing the use of the therapist COPM in practice, uh, while still kind of improving OT practice at the same time. A couple more things to highlight. Again, we didn't talk a whole lot about the electronic medical record modifications, um, but I really think that it's important to reflect the changes that are wanted in practice within whatever the documentation systems uh, is that's being utilized within rehabilitation. Because in a lot of ways, if it wasn't written down, it didn't happen. And documentation not only provides a record of the plan of care, the goals and the interventions, but it's really also a communication tool. So kind of a secondary focus of this project uh, was to have documentation that not only supported uh, communication between healthcare providers, um, but it also allowed for additional opportunities in the future for research so that we could pull that information later on and look at trends of the COPM use and how that potentially was impacting outcomes. And lastly, I just wanted to focus again on feedback. Again, not a new concept for anyone, I'm sure, uh, listening in today, uh, but it's really critical for successful knowledge translation and to maintain that sustainability. And so I think by having that information within the electronic medical record, being able to pull specific trends for each of the therapists was really helpful information to share. Uh, with each individual team member, um, as well as the teams collectively, because uh, they can't really change their practice if they're not sure um, what needs to change specifically about them. I think as a clinician myself, I think sometimes I think that I'm, you know, checking all the boxes and getting everything done and assuming that someone else is uh, the person why group norms are lower or something like that in terms of organizational reports. Um, but I think individual feedback can really go a long way by um, improving the sustainability specifically of this project and others that are similar to it. And then finally, I've just included a slide for some potential future uh, reasons to further support uh, the topic of knowledge translation projects related to the COPM and other similar assessments and kind of areas for improvement in the future uh, to conclude this presentation. So I think that this was a, a nice initial step in kind of exploring the knowledge translation process and how it potentially impacts the use of the COPM during inpatient stroke rehabilitation. But like I've mentioned before, I think there's still some continued room for improvement. And I think um, what was nice about 
the occupational therapist really kind of driving our conversations is that as they got more engaged in the process, they also had more questions uh, to explore. So I included the one on here that always comes up is kind of determining what the appropriate timing for administration of the assessment potentially uh, could be and kind of exploring different strategies uh, to make that the most successful. So I want to thank you all for uh, joining me for my presentation. Um, and I wanted to also acknowledge the therapists that participated and the time and energy that they gave to the specific project. Um, I had students from Rush University that assisted, particularly with the chart reviews. Um, so I wanted to make sure that they were acknowledged as well as the other contributors uh, related to my doctoral project and the, the subsequent related projects as well. So uh, with that, I'll stop there and I'll open up for questions and discussion. All right, thank you so much, Piper. That was an interesting presentation. Um, I see the selected references and photo credits are on the slide now. At this time, I would like to invite our reactors to turn on their webcams as I introduce you, and for Piper to turn on your webcam as well, please. Great, thank you so much. Um, First, allow me to introduce our esteemed reactors. We have Kate Dunn. She is a knowledge translation specialist at the Saskatchewan Center for Patient-Oriented Research, or SCIPR. She works closely with SCIPR's partners, researchers, and students to achieve their knowledge translation goals. And Kate has a Bachelor's of Art from McMaster University in Sociology and Health Studies and a Master's of Public Health from the University of Saskatchewan. Kate is passionate about embedding people's lived experience in research teams and knowledge translation initiatives. Also joining us is Janet Panock from the Amputee Coalition. She is a doctoral candidate in health communications with a special interest in patient provider communication and medical decision making. She's been active in patient advocacy for her daughter since 2007 due to osteosarcoma treatment complications. Janet's dissertation uses a KT framework on qualitative inquiry with families making surgical decisions for the treatment of osteosarcoma in the lower extremity. We also have with us Dr. Jean Windsor. She is a senior research associate at the Institute for Community Inclusion or ICI and her research focuses on state systems and integrated employment with an emphasis on bridging research to practice through technical assistance to employment system stakeholders. She has been the longtime coordinator of ICI's annual national survey of state intellectual and developmental disabilities, agencies employment and day services. She is also a policy specialist for the State Employment Leadership Network and Rehabilitation Research and Training Center on Advancing Employment for Individuals with Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. If she wasn't busy enough, she's also the project director for the Florida Employ Me First project. So thank you all for joining us today. It, we had a few questions coming in from the audience and I'd like to invite all the audience members, if you have questions for Piper or for any of the reactors, to go ahead and chat them in the chat box now. Um, uh, this one's for you, Piper. Um, we had one comment that said it was interesting that there were no traditionalists in the group. Uh, do you have ideas about that, why that might be and why there were so many seekers too? Yeah, I also was very surprised by that because I've kind of used the same survey for students, for occupational therapists, for physical therapists, um, and usually it very much matches the study that I referenced from 2007. I think uh, I think I'm, you know, specifically for this group, I think because they were um, newer clinicians, uh, they were really excited about being in a research hospital. So I think they were trying to take every opportunity that they could. And that was reflected in some of their answers, um, as well as I think that it's a very uh, academic hospital setting, um, which might be different than some other kind of traditional rehabilitation settings. And I think that might uh, just draw clinicians that are more engaged in evidence-based practice in general. Definitely. And this is a very personal question. Where do you think you lie on that continuum? I take this all the time to see if it changes. Um, I do tend to uh, fall into the seeker category myself. 
Interesting. Yeah. It seems like a diverse group would be great to have as a team. Yeah, I think so, that you need, kind of need to have representatives from all the different groups in a lot of ways to propel change. I think that, like I had mentioned, the seekers can really uh, be the drivers of change and kind of bring the information to the group, but also can do it um, without kind of thinking through some of those uh, specific steps that might be needed to really be successful and to actually translate uh, change into practice. Definitely. We have another question coming in um, before I get to the reactor uh, discussion area. Uh, Sue Lynn, she's a member of our uh, KTDRR's um, community of practice on uh, EDR and is an occupational therapist. And she says um, they had similar resu results. They surveyed 151 OTs and PTs in the U.S. who treat stroke survivors. One of those who indicated that they use uh, movement-related standardized assessment more than 75% of the time, 71% were PTs, 29% were OTs. Do you know if there is an association between the level of education and the use of standardized assessments? Um, hello, Susan. Um, I don't know if there's necessarily an association between the level of education. I'm not as familiar with that. Um, but I do think that occupational therapists tend to march their own drum a little bit sometimes in that we really focus on the occupations that are meaningful to the person, really individualizing that practice. And I think that um, we don't necessarily always incorporate those standardized assessments into our practice because it it can feel a little bit more restrictive at times than um, some of my PT colleagues. Great, thank you so much. Um, Jean, I'm going to switch gears a little bit. Have you adapted practice guidelines and tailored KT strategies in your work in any of your projects? Absolutely, and um, you know, having um, the opportunity to really take some time and look at Piper's um, implications for clinical practice so much resonated with me and I saw so much crossover between the ICI's work, particularly with employment support professionals um, and job developers. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the work that my colleague Alberto Migliori has actually led for more than five years now, um, trying to really understand not only um, what is the disconnect between employment service providers' knowledge about best practice, but trying to understand how to infuse uh, support and coaching within their daily practice to improve performance. Um, and the work that they have done, um, and again, led by my colleague, um, Alberto Migliore, has really focused on the development of a daily um, survey that is delivered through a smartphone application. Um, and through that survey, not only are they collecting data, data on a daily basis, um, point in time where the employment support professional is and what they're doing and the, whether or not they're engaging in the best practices that we know that help more people with disabilities get jobs in the community, but I was able to use that data and then tailor intervention and coaching information and small bits of information back to those support professionals, again, on through communities of practice and also through their the application and other opportunities that they have to interact with those. And they have found that that has been a really valuable tool because so many employment support professionals are not sitting in an office. They're, they don't have, they're acting out there you know, really on their own, having to navigate challenging situations on a daily basis. And so having that daily survey really um, was a fantastic opportunity for them to get some support as well as for us to continue to understand what is the interaction between best practice and what's happening in the field. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Anne. Thank you, Jean. Um, Kate, I'll turn this over to you. Uh, Piper mentioned briefly about um, peer mentorship or learning to be an effective PT strategy in the, in the work. Have you found this similar to your experience or have you found other strategies to be effective in implementing an innovation among practitioners? 
And thanks, Piper. Excellent presentation. I uh, kept thinking to myself um, as I sit here in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, that um, unfortunately we're not really lucky in the sense of having a, a big group of occupational therapists in Saskatchewan. You can't get trained here, and so a lot of people go away to other provinces and end up staying there. So uh, I'm a, I was a little jealous during your presentation hearing all of that uh, beautiful uh, OT work that's happening. But uh, yeah, very, um, very effective knowledge translation strategies in um, creating some mentoring and peer uh, learning environments. Uh, one study that we're supporting right now is really coming to light. It is a physiotherapist who's doing research with um, uh, individuals with MS and she's introducing um, some different techniques and exercises to an MS population through using physios. And uh, sure enough, the uptake in her project within uh, two months, they had uh, over 300 people recruited, which is um, absolutely outstanding. And um, the buy-in from the uh, physio point of view has just been um, unreal and tons of support from, from the team. So I think when you're discussing uh, peer mentorship and peer engagement, um, you're, you're hitting the nail on the head. And then I really liked what you said about um, maintaining and beginning with communication and buy-in. Uh, that's, that's so key and so critical from the very beginning, explaining to the healthcare providers and the healthcare decision makers um, what you're researching, what you're trying to accomplish, um, and bringing them along on the journey and keeping them up to date, whether that's um, the success story or some of the challenges of implementing um, the different strategies that your research is uh, trying to unfold. So um, excellent presentation, and I really like those two, two points. So thank you. Thank you so much, Kate. Piper, would you like to respond to that or? No, I, I think, yeah, I think that I agree. It's, um, it's really about making sure that people feel like they're kind of owning the topic and owning the change. And it's not necessarily something that's being brought to them. Um, so even in our, I didn't mention this, but we also had a focus group kind of previous to even beginning this project um, that really kind of focused on what were some of their barriers and in, in providing the kind of care that they wanted to provide. And it kind of led us to this pathway of, they wanted to be more occupation focused, more client focused. And so um, we were able to then kind of channel that into um, utilizing the COPM to help direct some of that and to obtain some of that information in a more objective way. Definitely, thank you. Um, Janet, I'll, I'll turn the mic over to you. Um, during Piper's presentation, she discussed a few methods of maintaining communication with and by and among practitioners, not the, what did she say, train and pray uh, philosophy. Um, what recommend, recommendations do you have for supporting communication and buy-in? Yeah, that's a really good question. Can you hear me okay? Just fine. Okay, good. Um, you know, when it comes to sort of the time suck involved with the electronic health record and trying to instill these kinds of communication skills, we always get a lot of pushback from practitioners and clinicians, and that's an ongoing problem. But I think that, um, and we talk a lot about training and, you know, all these things we can do to prepare clinicians to, you know, more effectively communicate with patients, but we don't really talk very much about what we can do with for the patients or the consumer on that side. And so because we don't do very much patient advocacy training or communication skills training with the patients, oftentimes, you know, we as, as the patients default to sort of more of the passive, you know, role expecting the clinician to be the expert. And so um, as far as like, I think it would make the uh, clinician's position easier in the sense that if we were to offer some training for the patients, letting them know what the expectations are to be active, you know, in their healthcare and to communicate some of those things you showed as an example in the occupational health profile, for example, um, things about their environment, things about themselves that give a more global picture so that the uh, practitioner doesn't have to spend so much time sort of teasing it out. You know what I mean? So if, if everybody is coming to the table expecting to be partners in this, it takes far less time for everybody, which kind of alleviates that electronic health record time suck aspect. It also, you know, contributes greatly to patient satisfaction, better health outcomes, and so on. So if everybody sort of has an understanding of that, I think that that would 
I think that that would help. But I really think we overlook patient communication skills training, letting them know that they are expected to advocate for themselves and expected to share this kinds of information to, to have better health outcomes. That's a, that's a really great point, Janet. Thank you for sharing that. We sometimes um, miss that. And I know from a patient perspective, sometimes you're a little nervous to talk to the doctors. Like they know your, the situation best. They're the experts, but really you're the experts of your own health too. That's exactly right, yeah. Yeah, um, we had a couple questions coming into the chat box. Um, let's see, Shanpin, um, uh, forgive me if I'm mispronouncing that, asked, walking or ambula ambulation is the occupation that is usually not in the scope of OT practice. What is the proportion of the goals that is about to, quote, be able to walk? And how do you manage this goal specified by patients. Piper, do you have an idea about that? Yeah, so that's a great question. And I think that is uh, the number one kind of most common uh, scenario when you initially meet someone and you ask them kind of uh, what, their, what their goal is for uh, leaving the hospital. One of the first things for just about everyone that I see is that they wanna be able to walk again. And I think um, what we've been working on within the organization and, and something that I think is important is to then ask additional questions outside of that. So I think that we also can't, uh, because you know, walking isn't necessarily part of occupational therapy, but I can also ask follow-up questions surrounding like, where do they want to walk to and where do they like to go and kind of spin the question a little bit um, to learn more about, um, you know, holistically about kind of what is it about, um, you know, wanting to walk again that, that really is the most meaningful. Maybe they go for a walk with, uh, with their dog every day and that can lead to another conversation about other meaningful activities. Um, so we want to make sure that we acknowledge that as a primary goal, but also um, utilize that as a way to get to other things too. Oh, thank you so much for that clarification. Um, another question was coming in from Ashley from the UVM Medical Center in Vermont. Can you speak to the overall duration of your project from beginning to end? And did you measure the change in percentage of administration of the COPM pre-implementation and post? And if so, what was the delta? Mm -hmm. um, so specifically for this project from the beginning to the end, it was a um, kind of eight week project. So we had uh, people come in for the uh, pre-focus group, um, complete their surveys, they came to a one hour in service and then they had uh, two weeks to go out and practice. We came back together as a group one additional time. Um, and then they had a couple more weeks to, to test out, um, you know, again, some of the, the things that we discussed um, until the end of the six week pilot. So it was pretty quick in, in terms of, of the time that we took specifically at this juncture. Um, I don't necessarily have a comprehensive um, idea of the change in percentage of administrations totally specifically within that floor. Um, we do track that now. We track the use of all the different assessments. Um, and right now, the COPM administration within our complete battery of assessments uh, is kind of right in the first half of frequently used assessments within the team. So we're also working right now to define uh, what assessments demonstrate the most change in different types of people that are coming for rehabilitation. Thank you so much. Um, another question's come in um, from Elizabeth. Uh, she's in a university setting and she mentions there are researchers who have evidence-based research, uh, be it for example, evaluations or interventions, but don't know how to get those into the clinic. We're trying to think about how we can facilitate the flow or accessibility of this work into the hands of clinicians. Uh, First, Piper, do you have any thoughts? And I'll turn it to the reactors after, after you chime in. Um, I think that some of it kind of depends on, you know, the different evaluation or assessment. But I think off the top of my head, a couple of things that come to mind is trying to find kind of a community collaborator, um, someone who might have some kind of connection to the university that can kind of be your advocate within the clinic. And I also think um, that utilizing students can be really helpful in that, you know, um, in occupational therapies, 
um, students go out for different internships at different clinics or different clinical sites, um, and they usually have to do a project. And so one of those projects can also be kind of taking this new assessment and educating the team about that um, if it's relevant to where they, they are. Great, thank you. Uh, uh, Kate or Jean or Janet, what, uh, what, do you have a thought about this topic? So, and I think about the fact that I'm also in a, in a university setting. Um, and one of the things that we at the Institute for Community Inclusion have access to is our rehabilitation studies program. Um, and a strong connection has been built over many years with that uh, department and organization. And that's one place that we very intentionally formed relationships um, so that information can cross over directly and be implemented by students as they're learning so it becomes part of their natural practice and not necessarily an add-on. Um, I also think about our role as a University of Excellence in Developmental Disabilities and the connection that that also provides to our LEND program. Um, and again, that opportunity to develop those intentional connections and to ensure that individuals who are participating in these have access to the most up-to-date information is really such an important piece. Um, and that gatekeeper and finding the right person to develop and establish those long-term relationships is so crucial. Great, thank you, Jean. Um, I realized I missed a question that was in the chat box, so let me go back up to that one. Um, let's see. Forgive me as I scroll. Uh, Cheryl Moser asks, was one of the aims of the study to determine whether OT practice style, for example, for example, seeker influence or predicted whether the COPM form could be used in practice? And secondary, is your opinion based on your data and this study outcome, what might be another stronger predictor for whether the COPM form will be used in practice? Uh, Piper? Yeah, so we were curious to see if uh, what someone uh, kind of self-rated themselves as kind of influenced their use of new knowledge and, and kind of really jumping on and utilizing the, the knowledge translation uh, techniques and strategies that were adjusted. Um, so I think that was kind of an interesting uh, addition um, while also trying to utilize this, uh, increase the utilization of the assessment itself just globally within practice. Um, and I kind of thinking about other stronger predictors about the COPM, I think, you know, in addition to kind of practice patterns, I also think that um, things around kind of emotional intelligence potentially could be related to kind of how comfortable someone might feel utilizing this assessment. And it's all those, I think this was mentioned before, um, those kind of soft skills of being able to really have uh, be able to be in a kind of uncomfortable space while you're having a conversation with people is really important. And I find kind of as, you know, a more senior clinician within the organization and just globally interacting with students, that that's something that's really hard to learn. Um, and so I think that's an opportunity uh, in rehabilitation across the board to how to best facilitate those kind of conversations and utilize tools um, like the COPM. Mm. Definitely, and it kind of relates a little bit back to what Janet was mentioning earlier, being able to, to be in the moment and listen to the patients at the table, right? So, Piper, thank you so much, and thank you to our reactors. I'll ask you all to turn off your webcams now, and we're going to move along to our next presentation. <laughs> 